Hello, 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 and welcome. I'm Meron Khalili, and this is a DMTV frontline interview. And today I'm talking with Esteban Servat. He's a scientist, he's an environmental activist, and he's the founder of EcoLeaks, which you can imagine what that is by the name. And he's also a campaigner with the Debt for Climate campaign. He's got a fascinating story. Esteban, welcome. Uh, good to good to see you. Thank you How are you doing? Nice you're speaking to us now from Munich, just uh, ahead of the G7 summit, where you're there for some, let's say, activist uh, activist projects. Um, yes. How's it going over there? What's the vibe? Good. Things are very intense right now. We're planning a global action to hold the G7 accountable for their climate debt. And, you know, they're meeting here near Munich next Monday and Tuesday. So we have actions in, in more than 30 countries and there's a lot going on. Okay. Yeah. As we record, I mean, we're recording now on Thursday, 23rd of June. Um, Esteban, I know that we don't have much time, so let's just jump straight into it. Can you tell us who are you and what do you do? Give us your background. Sure. I'm a scientist from Argentina, but I spent 10 years of my life in the belly of the beast, working in the Silicon Valley in California for some of the biggest multinational health companies uh, in vaccine development and, and immunology. And uh, after that, I, I realized I was very young and I realized, you know, all of that was just... Um, not helping any of the diseases that we have in the global south, in Latin America, we have Chagas, Malaria, Leishmania, and all these corporations are only there to make uh, money and not for what they claim to, which is human health. So I, I did my, my master's study there and I, I worked for nearly 10 years and then I went back to Argentina with the idea to start an eco project, and a community, a self-sustainable community project that I also had in mind for many years. And that's the reason I moved to this area called Mendoza province. Mm -hmm. It's a wine, beautiful wine region that uh, I moved there because after traveling the northwest of Argentina, I noticed I went to see the devastation caused by mega mining that is really destroying our country and our planet uh, for mining for gold and silver, you know, blowing up the mountaintops and using an enormous amount of water and contaminating that with cyanide, mercury, sulfuric acid and so on. And I saw the devastation firsthand, but I learned that Mendoza was an exception to the rule because in 2007, the people massively mo mobilized to the streets and blocked the roads and stayed there for a long time until they achieved a law banning the use of um, mega mining in Mendoza. And the reason is this is a desert. The province is a desert, very little water. So people have it in their DNA, the awareness to defend that water, the value of water. So I settled there because I wanted to be in a place where people understood the value and the need to fight for the environment when it was threatened. So, so although and, it was kind of a, a very, um, I mean, there's a relatively low literacy rate, I believe, in this area, but you, it was a, a base of activism where people had successfully fought off the establishment and got um, mining banned. Yeah, I think it's a lesson to many progressives that, um, you know, there is a lot of academics, there's a lot of highly intellectual people in the progressive world. And it's really humbling when you go to a place in rural Argentina or rural anywhere that fights for their environment and defends their water and has, is in the front lines. And it really teaches you that whatever, however many books you have read, however many libraries you have at home, however enlightened you may feel, these people mm -hmm. that are, they're not illiterate, but they're not necessarily, of course, they're not highly educated because there's not, um, uni there's not a lot of universities. So they, they usually have the secondary school degree and that's it. Mm -hmm. And um, that those people have a lot to teach you. Those people, even though they are not activists, they are not necessarily progressive. They are rural, family value, uh, you know, farm mm -hmm. farmers and so on. But they have such awareness and consciousness on the importance of water that it's really, it really, it, it's really touching. And the way that a mass movement can be built with these people is extremely powerful. I think it has a lot to teach to, to activists in the global north that have so many filters to become an activist, mm -hmm. you must be all of these things. Sometimes I think we need to be the ones that put ourselves at the service of the frontliners of the world, 
even though they may not be progressive, they may not even have had a chance to read all these books or to go to university, but we should be the ones taking the step mm. of uh, greatness and generosity and the for lending the hand to put ourselves at the service of the frontline. I, it, it's nice to hear you say that. I mean, there's so much bullshit in leftist circles, left on left violence. Um, and these people, it, it seems to be really about survival um, and they did what they needed to do. So it's very heartwarming to hear you to hear you say that. And I wonder, I mean, maybe just as a parenthesis, what would you say could be learned if there are lessons from that successful activism in rural Argentina in 2007? What, if you could speak to all the leftist activists in, in the global north and, and tell them something about you know, what they should be doing better or what they should avoid doing, what would it be? I think at the root of it all is a paradigm shift that, um, that we are not the enlightened ones, that you in Europe are not the center of the world, that we need to break out of Eurocentrism. Right now, the world is upside down, and uh, the European activists, with a lot of good intentions, are trying to pave the way for climate action and for the future of the world. But maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's the frontliners of the world, especially in the global south, that have a lot of answers. And the answers are not necessarily ideological or theoretical, but they're very concrete. We're just defending our water. Get the fuck out of our land, you know? <laughs> just, you want to do something, you want to make a revolution, get Shell out of our land, get BP, get a Wintersal and Total out of our territories. If you're in France or in Belgium or in England, there's plenty of work to do. And it's not necessarily finding theoretical uh, answers, which are also necessary. But sometimes the theory is built as you go and the theory will come from the front lines and from the changes that can be made, achieving something. Right now we're achieving nothing and getting lost in these spiraling debates about uh, what is the perfect world that we need. But we are not doing, we're not achieving anything along the way to get there. And the frontliners are very practical and they are achieving goals to save your water, to save your land. We really need a paradigm shift and, you know, turn things upside down and start listening to the people that are suffering, the most affected mm -hmm. people and areas of the world. Well, thanks for that. Um, OK, I mean, back to your sort of timeline, as it was. 2018, uh, EcoSUR, which was your, um, your eco project in, in Mendoza, in rural Argentina, it was two years old. And then there was an announcement which, which changed the... Uh, the situation somewhat for you. Tell us about what happened. Yeah, unfortunately, Mendoza happened to be part of Vaca Muerta. Vaca Muerta is the world's second largest shale gas basin and fourth largest shale oil basin. It's about the size of Belgium. And it's a, it's a huge carbon bomb for the planet that is exploited through fracking. Fracking is an extremely contaminating technique that for that reason is banned in much of Europe. Yet it is the very multinational companies from those Western European countries, such as BP, Shell, Total, Repsol, Wintersal, Equinor, and others, that are leading the fracking operations in Vaca Morta and beyond. Fracking is also a leading cause of methane emissions for the planet, which is completely suicidal at a time when the IPCC and even the, the leading co uh, countries of the world are, are signing this global methane pledge at COP last year. And they're doing the exact opposite by expanding fracking. So at the end of 2017, fracking was introduced in Mendoza under a lot of silence. The biggest media group of Mendoza province were the same owners as the owners of the fracking company. And this is owned by two businessmen, one of which they're so powerful. They own most of Argentina's companies and all kinds of things, media, energy, and so on. And one of them now, I think, lives in Switzerland. He's so powerful that his name was in the Jeffrey Epstein's uh, list of flights, uh -huh. you know, with the president. little black book. Yeah, and he uses his mafia contacts and political contacts to basically open up Argentina for multinational companies to extract and destroy the country and exploit it. So this is what we were confronting. And uh, the media, as I said, were completely silent. The government brought fracking unconstitutionally through um, ex executive order of the governor. 
the mm. governor, just to paint you a full picture, was the most powerful in the country and was a key ally of Macri in building the right-wing coalition Cambiemos that was governing at the time. The governor was at the same time the president at a national level of this conservative party called uh, UCR that was the key ally of Macri. So it was not just any governor, but by far the most powerful mm. in Argentina. And when uh, fr fracking was introduced, the governor and the mayor in my city and many other officials at the time were the same people that 10 years earlier in 2007 had championed the fight against mining. In a province that is a desert, uh, fighting for the water translates into winning elections. And these people did that and used it masterfully. So, but by the time they were elected, they had no problem to betray everyone and throw their commitments off the window and bring fracking through an illegal executive order. So, at the end of 2017, the first few wells of fracking were um, were installed in Mendoza, and um, but not everyone wanted to go down in history as a traitor to the people. And there were people that I had gotten to know in the government, in technical positions, in government offices who really were very proud of their history to, to defend the water. And one of these offices was the one that was the, their role was to be vigilant for the safety of the water of Mendoza. Water is so important that it has its own institution mm. called the Irrigation Department. And they also do tests on water to control the quality, to control contamination and so on. So a whistleblower from this agency reached out to me and told me that the government had run a test on the first wells of fracking and the results were really bad. They were already contaminating the water table. They also were planning, they were hiding this report. They withheld it from the view of the public during the public hearing that decided the future of fracking. And was they were planning to replace the results with fake numbers that were going to be obtained at a university lab where the vice dean was at the same time a representative of the fracking company. A, a whistleblower reaches out to you. Now, I don't want to you know, go too deep into this because, of course, we must respect the, the anon anonymity of your source. But how did that happen? Was that just good fortune that somebody called you, Esteban, at, at this eco community and said, hey, I've got this report which proves that the government are, are lying about fracking or was there a, another kind of process i'm trying to understand for other people that may be in the same position what you did and how that might help to direct perhaps their their own actions well to tell you the long story short um, mendoza is a big province you know it's a big area with low population density and not many you know there's far apart towns and cities and the one i chose to settle in is a relatively small city I was in the farmland in the middle of nowhere, but the closest city was General Alvear, a 30,000 people town city. And it just so happened that the capital of the, the direction of um, the presidency of the irrigation department of the province was based in Alvear. And so that's where all of the studies were being managed. And I just happened to, during the years that I was there and I was becoming friends, this, you know, this is a small town and environmentalists befriend other environmentalists. So I held a lot of these people in a lot of, uh, in a high place. Uh, I, I always told them that it was because of them that I came to Mendoza because of the fight that they championed 10 years earlier. And these became my friends. So some of them betrayed the cause, but some of them didn't. And some of the contacts I had led me to... Also, you know, in a town like that, it's hard not to find out things. It's hard to keep things secret. The easiest way to get something to be known by everyone is to tell someone, hey, don't tell anyone. <laughs> I'll tell you a secret. Don't tell anyone. So eventually the news, this was so loaded that it reached me. And I, I, I set off to try to contact the, the, the original source and to get the report. It was not easy, it took time. It took a lot of efforts that I cannot um, explain to you right now, but we finally got that report and, and it set off a, a revolt that is still going in Mendoza. Okay, okay. So what did you do then? I mean, you're in possession of this bombshell report that proves that the government's lied about, about the damage that fracking is going to due to the region's water. 
what what do you do now? How do you publicize this? So for me, uh, Julian Assange was a very influential person in my life. You know, when WikiLeaks started, I, I remember um, I saw this revolutionary potential in WikiLeaks and what they were doing. So it always just stayed with me, the potential, the power of leaking uh, documents that should be public but have been censored. So when we had this report, we thought, well, um, why, why don't we create a, a platform that could be, of course, not have the technology of WikiLeaks or anything like that, just a simple website and a, and a Facebook page because everyone uses Facebook in Mendoza, um, just to help make this go viral. So um, that's what we did. We made Ecoleaks as a platform that could do environmental information leaks and publishing. And we started, basically, we needed that to have a platform on which to publish the report. And that's what we did on March uh, 16th or 18th of 2018. And then it set up a, a huge wave of revolts, but also persecution and death threats against myself and many other activists. Whoa, hold on. <laughs> so, I, uh, from what period? Uh, I mean, how? What was the timeline there between you posting that that report on Facebook and creating EcoLeaks? Uh, uh, I think something you've termed in another interview as a uh, a low tech WikiLeaks, um, mm -hmm. and and the government responding to that because what what would often happen with with many activists if they got this you know a report like this it might be posted somewhere and and then nobody really shares it and that's the end of it how do you yeah. how do you make sure that it gets on the radar of the government and on everybody else's radar that uh, has whose future would be jeopardized by by fracking yeah, initially that was my feeling as well, that I would just publish this and it would just be a bombshell and, and lead to revolts and nothing else would need to be done. <laughs> but it doesn't work like that. So, I, you know, I, I don't come from journalism, I come from science, so I have no clue how any of this stuff worked. I just thought, okay, you leak something that is true and people will look at it and they will understand it and they will... Um, they will take action, but or even the NGOs or the institutions that are supposed to be responsible for all of these things, but they were nowhere to be found. So the reaction was silence, and I had to put my face behind it to start defending and championing and pushing for this to get talked about. And that's why um, it got talked about, but also it had a huge cost on me. And how did that feel i mean you must have that must have been a little bit uh <laughs> I say, it must have made you feel pretty nervous doing that i mean you, you everyone knows where to find you you're in a continent latin america with the highest number of assassinations of environmental defenders in the last 15 years how did you feel putting your face to this document to, to tell you the truth you know the day i had to publish the report that i got as soon as i got it i needed to get it out of my hands uh, we didn't have internet in the farm. There was no connection. The, the connection was down. So I had to, to drive to the city. And this is a small city. Everyone was sleeping the siesta. At, you know, at, at, in the afternoon, everything is closed. There was only one little ice cream shop that was open and had really bad Wi-Fi. But I was sitting in this ice cream shop. <laughs> and I published the report from there. And um, frankly, when I published it, I felt you know, you might as well be committing suicide because I knew I was going into a very dark territory of huge interests that are beyond my control. The government, these multinationals, the media, the mafia, you know, these two businessmen have killed people in the past and anyone that opposes them uh, is gone. So um, that's what I felt, but also I felt there was no option, you know, if I would be to lie to myself, fracking was not only going to destroy our little project, that was just in the beginning stages, uh, but it, it will destroy everything else. And it's also part of Vaca Muerta, which is destroying our own country. So uh, for me, I didn't have a choice. Otherwise, I'd have to lie to myself and look the other way and pretend nothing is happening. Let me drill down a little bit on those tactics. I mean, you, you upload it to Facebook, you've got your, 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 your face behind it. But there were also some media interviews, some radio interviews that you did, I think, with some local uh, outlets that helped to amplify this message and put it on the radar. Tell us a little bit about those. 
Yeah, so the first thing that happened, I published it on a Friday. And the weird thing happened next, the next day was a Saturday and not a working day, right? And yet all the official government websites like Mendoza.gov, irrigation.gov, .r, um, all of these official bodies that are not working on a Saturday went out to publish a report that was contradicting our publication without mentioning us. They were trying to, you know, first they tried to ignore you and make you invisible. So basically they were trying to overlap our news with some fake news. The title was the results from fracking are in and everything is clean. You know, it has it was so obviously a negation of our publication. And the big media were also doing the same. So that's when I understood that, that unless I would come out and put my face and put my voice behind this, nothing would really happen. It would just get buried. It was just the report was four pages of numbers with a signature. And people, as you said, um, they are not, you know, none of them, a lot of them are not uh, university educated. They're not engineers. They're not scientists. So for them, it's like, oh, well, what, what do we know? This is just, could be just fake. Also, keep in mind, we know what EcoLeaks means the moment you hear it. But in Argentina, in rural Argentina, many didn't have a clue what that meant. They were like, what does EcoLeax mean? You know, reading it in mm. Spanish. So it took a lot of educational effort, communicational effort to explain what, how that was connected, inspired by WikiLeaks and what that means. And what I did, I managed to get a couple of interviews in really small local radios. The town that I was living in was at the forefront of the fight against mining 10 years earlier because it's probably one of the most affected. It's really the one of the first on the front lines of water scarcity. So the popular support for anything to defend water is overwhelming. And that's why I was there. So when a couple of radios that had continued this line of fighting and defending the water heard of it and I contacted them, these are really small radios. So it was really easy for me to go there and speak not easy for them, though, because they were taking a big chance. The government was really repressive and really could cut down your funding and anything. So they are taking big risks. But they did the interviews, and we recorded that, and we shared that on YouTube or on Facebook and, and on, um, on, on WhatsApp. We started sharing mm -hmm. that on WhatsApp and then started to spread. And politicians in Argentina are so discredited that when people began to hear a scientist speaking they were much mm. more likely to believe a scientist than they were to believe the, the mayor of their own city and mm. then the government started to get nervous and they started to make mistakes they started to contradict one another first they said the report was fake and totally unfounded then others were saying it was true but it was incomplete and being misinterpreted and then mm. different ones in different places of the province there were different officials in different towns they began to have declarations to the media that were all contradicting mm -hmm. one another. So we exploited their contradictions to start to show to the public how they were actually lying to them. And that worked very well. And they got more and more nervous. And a couple of weeks into all of this, I got, I got a call from the other major newspaper, the biggest newspaper of the province, which is in competition with the biggest media group that I was telling you about. And I don't whose know. owner whose owner was behind the fracking yes uh, yes right. and this other this other one is not they're not angels they may maybe they were just left out of the business or whatever and okay. or they wanted to hurt their competitor rival mafia guys so mm -hmm. the, the a, a well-meaning journalist contacted me he sounded very honest and he sounded like he was interested in this for the right reasons but then i didn't know all of what i know now who owned what and what was you know, this is something that on hindsight I can explain to you. But back then, I was just a scientist trying to build an eco village. You know, I didn't care about who owned what media or what was what was this political wars going on. So this journalist from the biggest uh, newspaper of the province contacted me and interviewed me. And the breaking the breakthrough came when he published that. He also did the, the work of contacting the lab where the study had been conducted and there was a signature on that report so he verified with the director of the lab that this was her signature and that this report was true and genuine although she could not say what it was about because these studies are conducted in a blinded or double blinded fashion so 
uh, but she, she verified that the numbers were correct, that that was her signature and that the study came from that place. So that was enough to, to just throw out the window all of what the government has been had been trying to say. And because of the outlet who published it, it was the biggest in the province, it really blew the, the shit out of the, of the roof. And then we started having a lot of mass mobilizations that were already building. The momentum was building, the tension was building, mm -hmm. because let alone the contamination, keep in mind that the betrayal that people felt, that the same people that they voted for to defend the water were the mm -hmm. same with betraying them behind their back, bringing fracking that is as bad as mega mining. Tell me a little bit about the mass mobilizations that you were just about to talk about. I mean, how's the, you know, that trans, as soon as everybody found out about the report and the damage that fracking could cause, they, they put into practice the same, the same activist networks, the same um, capacity to mobilize as they had a decade before um, against mining. I mean, how, how did that work and how did they suddenly show up in the streets and, and manage to, Creative well, resistance. It was even more complex because the governor and the mayor and all these officials, they were coming from, they were the some of the visible heads of the fight against mining and they had all the contacts and the connections with the climate activists from 10 years earlier mm -hmm. so as to buy them, to neutralize them or to, you know, to demobilize them. So. We not only had to fight the, the companies, the media, the weaponized justice system and all the other things, but also some of the old structures of, of activism that were totally bought and co-opted to neutralize the struggle. But the struggle became so powerful because it sprouted from the people. It was really a mass movement emerging from that, from their memory, the public memory of the struggle 10 years earlier that had been built up for many years together with a new generation of, of, of land defenders, water defenders that came to the streets. And, uh, and it just had so much power. We mobilized uh, 15,000 in my town in one demo out of a population of 30,000. So 50% of the people on the streets, of course, you never heard of it because the media of the global north don't share these stories, but we, and that was just one town, but we had tens and tens of thousands of people all over the province. It became the largest movement against fracking in Argentina's history. And later I know, I learned when you put it into context, in perspective, it's the biggest in the world. You've never seen uh, 50,000, 100,000 people mobilizing against fracking anywhere in the world. And um, it's really a mass movement. It doesn't have... Um, an organization or, 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 or a leadership that is organized, but it's actually the people defending the water. When, when we call upon them to mobilize, they're ready to mobilize to, um, to try to ban fracking, which in this case, they didn't allow us. We were, you know, keep in mind, we were messing with the world's second largest shale gas basin and fourth largest shale oil basin. Behind the governor was President Macri. Behind Macri was President Trump who was the real, you know, he was pushing for the fracking industry to expand everywhere. And Mendoza was simply the new frontier. The G20 mm -hmm. met in Argentina that year with the specific goal of discussing the advance of fracking. And you can still find the, the tweets from Rick Perry, the energy secretary of Trump, who was coming from Texas, the birthplace of fracking. He actually said, you know, Argentina has a huge potential in, in the shale of Vaca Muerta, we are here to help expand that. In fact, they sent a delegation of the Sherpas of the G20 actually met in Mendoza to discuss all these things. So that's what we're up against. And if we were to be successful banning fracking in Mendoza, which seven law drafts by different parties were introduced for the banning of fracking because it was such a powerful movement at the time, but if we were to be successful in that, we will deal a death blow to Vaca Morta because we would inspire the neighboring provinces that have suffered it for many more years than Mendoza to show, to show them that it's possible and that together we could actually ban fracking there. And keep in mind also, the, this is so strategically important that the U.S. is building a military base in the heart of Vaca Morta under the guise of humanitarian aid that nobody needs there. The only humanitarian crisis there is fracking. So there is no war, there is no civil war, anything like that. 
but it's just that Vaca Muerta is the next frontier after the U.S. depletes its own shale reserves. Vaca Muerta will be the next source for decades to come of gas and oil through fracking. But behind all of this are companies from Europe, right? I mean, a lot of the products are coming to Europe. Which companies are these companies? They're headquartered in in many of them in, in Northern Europe, where you are right now. Yeah, the biggest holders, there's European and American companies, of course, there's Exxon and Chevron, but from the from Europe, you have BP from England, Shell, which is now in, based in England. Uh, uh, Repsol had found the, the basin and then had lost it because of uh, the country nationalized the company that Repsol was the most, uh, YPF is the national oil company, but Repsol played a big role. Uh, Total is a huge player. They are contaminating. The, they they've been found to have open pits of uh, disgusting, you know, contaminating material, violating all the environmental laws. Wintersal from Germany, the biggest mm-hmm. oil and gas company of Germany that nobody knows about, is also one of the biggest players. Equinor from Norway, which is a publicly owned, state-owned company that is from a supposedly progressive government and and green friendly government in Norway, they are leading the destruction in Vaca Muerta. Those are some of the European companies and those are the ones that we've been focusing on since I arrived here three years ago right. to really put the pressure to stop them from fracking on the other side of the world and to stop the import of those products here. Here being Berlin, um, Europe, where, yeah. well, Europe or Germany where you are now. So you really putting your finger in the eye of some really big powers here. Tell me how they reacted and what sort of things that they did in order to intimidate you and your colleagues. So the preferred method there is to create, fabricate criminal cases. Since they fully control the legal system and some people still believe in the legal system, that's how they use that to, in a way, discredit you at the same time as scare you. And just criminal cases began to rain down on me and later on others who were becoming annoying to the people, to the government because the, the movement multiplied everywhere. But clearly I was one of the most visible faces. So I was a main target of attack because if they could prove me wrong or the, if they could force me to say, to pull back, you know, to say that it was a mistake or something. So the first criminal case came from no one other than the mayor of my city fully supported by the governor and the president. He was just being the front man of carrying this case against me. So the, the most powerful guy of the city was filing a legal case against me, trying to make me to pull back from saying that he was part in this hiding of this report, which he was a key player in hiding that and so on. But at the time, you know, with no resources and no money and no power other than a simple website, we managed to defeat them in several of these cases by calling on the people to mobilize in, in our support. What cases? What were you alleged to have done? So there's many. Then they, they accused me of drug trafficking. They planted drugs in our farm. They sent people to occupy a part of the farm with forged documents that gave them some kind of ownership, some title from being the heirs of someone who lived there 100 years earlier. A lot of cases, like I'm also indicted on public intimidation, which is accusing me of causing panic in the people. And that's why they were mobilizing for saying something false when it was, right. all I was saying is the scientific truth of why fracking is banned. And many, many other uh, uh, legal cases and medias, many media operations that you can find about me accusing us of all kinds of things. So but it's the lawfare. Case, just like Assange, lawfare. It's lawfare. Yeah, lawfare, at a, at, you know, not as a precedent level, but that's what they use against activists. Before they murder you, they use the lawfare to, to, to try to shut you down. And because I knew this was the, the, the dynamics of the system, maybe I, I was crazy to do this, but everything they threw at me, I threw it back 10,000 times bigger. So I made a much bigger deal because I knew that the whole goal of this was to intimidate us and by making an example of people like me they would force everyone else to get scared so but how how that, do you throw it back a hundred times bigger they've got the megaphone they've got the, the authority the expertise you don't i mean you found lawyers how, how do you do that 
What was the yeah, so, of your so response? The case, the case became well known enough that some lawyers volunteered to help us because I also didn't have money to be wasting and spending on so much legal stuff. And um, I asked my lawyer who, uh, with the first case that was with the mayor, I said, how on earth could we possibly defeat this man? Uh, when the legal system is fully behind him, even if we present all the evidence, they're going to to, to decide on his favor and going to go to jail. And um, the, the the lawyer said, well, the only way would be if he doesn't show up for the public hearing where he and I were supposed to face off. The mayor. That public, yeah, the mayor. And that's supposed to be like a conciliatory meeting where the, the parties are supposed to face off and, say, and see if we can um, settle something. And of course, the mayor was expecting that I would come on my knees and say, sorry, sir, you know, I was wrong. You know, I didn't mean to say that you were part of that. And maybe I made a mistake or something because he knew I would be thrown in jail. But I just did the exact opposite. I said, well, I know a way how he, how to make him not come to the hearing, which is to call on the people, because by then he was so afraid of his own people. It was just right after we mobilized 15,000, you know, that... Those 15,000 mobilized at a time when there was a national event happening in this town that happens once a year, the most important event. Sometimes the president comes, the governor, and many high-level officials come. And it was the first time in the history of the town over 100 years that the mayor did not show up to the event because he was afraid of us, of the people. It was right after I made it to the national media, we were able to be seen by millions of people. So we got the stuff out of the censorship of Mendoza borders. And um, and so I knew that it was a weak point for him at that time. So I just went on Facebook and on the social media and I say, you know, on Tuesday we have, or I don't remember the day, but there is this public hearing. And if the mayor doesn't show up, we win the case and we mm. deal them a major blow. So I call on all the people to come. And a lot of people came from the town and the mayor didn't show up. <laughs> and so he, he lost the case and he had to present his resignation to the case, which was really really shamefully written and humiliating for himself and okay. he said uh, as a mayor of the city i have really important things to do and i don't have time to continue this case but you started the case <laughs> so <laughs> you know these were all things that helped fuel the fire and make people feel excited and uh, that we have a chance to win it if we are smart and if okay. we get together okay i mean that's your response to the lawfare um that they were uh, raining down upon you as you said but also the death threats and some of the more um, underground ways that they were, were threatening you and and others. Tell us a little bit about that and how that made you feel because you you seem to be pretty pretty hard on all this stuff and I know many activists that might go, look, this is not worth it. Uh, I can't I can't deal with this. I'm jeopardizing my future or at some point I'm jeopardizing my well-being. Um, so tell me about that and why you think you reacted in the way that you react yeah clearly it wasn't as wise as maybe i should have been because i had to leave afterwards you know sooner or later you up the game until you can no longer up the game anymore when they started to threaten my family i was already getting threats and, and deal threats through people uh, letting me know that i would things would happen to me but then uh, in 2019, after a full year of very intense fighting and persecution and things when people went put in jail, other people had to go into exile into other provinces or to the capital of Buenos Aires. And, and uh, at the end of 2018, the governor approved a code of conduct that was criminalizing protests like we had in the 70s during the dictatorship. So it all helped weaken and scare the people and the movement. And in my case, in 2019, I managed to turn around a couple of the criminal cases that they had fabricated against me. One of them was the one I just told you about. I just, I, I returned the favor to the mayor by filing a criminal case against him mm -hmm. because what he did was a forge, you know, he fabricated um, uh, an argument that was false and that's a crime. So we returned the favor at a time when he was running for re-election. 2019 was an election year, and that's when really it hurt them. And they started to threaten my family, my girlfriend, and they told me that my, my girlfriend was going to suffer most of the consequences for my, my actions. As long as I could feel the power of the people on the streets, I, I felt safe. I felt, well, I didn't feel safe, but I felt it was, whatever happened was worth it because we were building a revolution. 
and um, as as long as as soon as they were able to start debilitating that uh, it's different anything that could happen to you maybe people are too afraid to to defend anyone anymore or to mobilize anymore also i had insider information that they were planning something uh, hard against me to put me in jail and the character assassination probably murdered me inside of jail you know uh, with a knife attack or something and say that uh, i was you know they were trying to accuse me of violence so once you're in jail they could just say well yeah we told you he was violent he got in the fight and they they um stabbed him to death and the media is not going to go there to find out what really happened they don't even care to to report what happens outside so these were the conditions upon which you know uh, dying for this cause was not the problem if it was worth it if it could if it could help lead to to a victory but knowing that dying for the sake of dying uh it was not the best idea and also when my girlfriend could be assassinated or raped or anything else could happen to her and i didn't have the right to keep putting her and my family in this uh situation and that's why i decided uh to to come here but also to keep hitting them as soon as I came to Europe, what I did is just to start throwing missiles at them from, from the first world, from, from Europe, and just try to mobilize the climate movements, try to raise awareness. And we have done such great global actions that a lot of people in Europe in the climate movements are talking about fracking even before the gas crisis with Russia. And there's a lot of awareness that fracking has to end and we are getting there and i think globally we'll be able to bring it to an end which we would we wouldn't be able to do unless we were able to have impact in europe as well tell me a bit about the debt for climate campaign which your activist energy is now going towards i mean right now as we said you're in you're in munich for the g7 and you'll be campaigning and protesting uh for the debt for climate campaign there how how did that get kicked off and and what are the goals of that campaign yeah so we've been doing huge actions uh germany and the gelände the biggest mass movement in germany is now an anti-fracking anti-gas movement and we've built a global coalition called shale must fall inspired and with shell must fall and uh, brought together a lot of groups around the world and frontliners and last year we did the biggest uh, global action against fracking in history and this year we'll do it again in august but also in the meantime we've been doing a lot of actions and visibilizing the front lines of the global south and Bacamorta in the centers of power because i think that's the way to go um but also we realized that behind the advance of fracking the advance of mining and offshore drilling and deforestation and so many other things in the global south there is a common denominator which is debt that is a burden on the neck of the global south as soon as we became independent from spain in latin america we went right into becoming a neo-colony of britain and this was done through loans that were unpayable that had huge interest rates and uh, this debt this is mostly illegitimate obvious debt that forces the global south to keep paying back just the interest for that they need to continue the deforestation advance the fossil fuel industry and so on and over the years of me working with groups, Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion, and the Gelende, all the climate groups around Europe and globally, I become more and more convinced that unless we have the workers, you know, we need the working class of the world and we need this, the worker unions of the world to be united in this fight. And nobody seems to be able to do that. And of course, we know that climate change is not one of their immediate needs. They are focused on a lot more urgent needs for food and, and jobs and so on. But when we connect debt and climate, we are able to start building that bridge at an unprecedented global scale. And I'm not talking about the labor unions of Europe yet, but the labor unions of the global South really understand the need to cancel the debt that is burdening in their future and their present and for generations to come. So when you go to the worker unions of the Global South and you tell them we are building a campaign to cancel the debt of the Global South and take, be able to take climate action to relieve our countries of this debt that also prevents us from being able to achieve any climate goal and a just transition and leaving fossil fuels in the ground, the global north continues you know they talk a lot of nice stuff but in reality they're fueling this 
And uh, the IMF, the World Bank, this is the G7, this is the top 1% of the world that is controlling us, concentrated power and financial power that is destroying the planet, the groups more respons most responsible for the climate crisis, are the ones meeting here near Munich next, next Monday and Tuesday. So mm. we realize that with this is what we can build a strong enough, a broad and powerful enough global coalition of forces that brings together labor movements, climate movements, and social movements at an unprecedented scale to demand debt cancellation for climate action so that then in a decentralized fashion, each country of the global south can have a chance to find their own way, decide their own future, and, and fund a just transition with the money that otherwise would be going to pay these obvious debts. So that's where it's connected. And we're just fighting like fracking, mining, and so on. And we continue the fracking fight. But we also understood that we need to go a level higher in order to be able to bring enough groups together that otherwise just on fracking or mining you only have the small assemblies and frontline communities and activists here it's just not enough power and it's not a matter of science or truth anymore we have the truth we have the science on our overwhelmingly on our side um but it's a matter of power how can we build enough power on the streets to start evening the but the the unbalance the disbalance of power to force any of these actions to be taken. And that's what we are building with that for climate. Interesting. And, and how how has the response been from other um, environmental groups um, and, and activists? Because this is a different a different take on climate activism that you're proposing. Um, what's the what's the level of support that you've managed to to get so far with this? It's amazing. It's the, by far the biggest and most exciting action that I have been part of. And it's a little bit is building up from the, the networks of solidarity that we have been building over the last three years, doing actions in uh, global solidarity. It's many of these same networks are behind championing this campaign. And it's just built in and included so many new different groups that would otherwise not be part of this unless we were connecting debt and climate. You can see in one Zoom call with 60 people from uh, 40 countries all over the world with trilingual translation, the diversity from indigenous people to, actually we have a, a union of Argentinian workers, the, 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 the judges, a union that has all the judges together, they're interested in joining. And I'm sure many of those judges mm -hmm are the ones that executed <laughs> me three years ago. <laughs> so I want to ask them to cancel my 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 cases yeah. as well. But yeah. the diversity is, is so broad and that's our power. The groups that don't normally belong together are coming together and even though they don't agree on everything, they barely can agree on anything, they agree on debt for climate. And that's what we need to do, bring those groups together to have enough power. And how can people learn more about the, the debt for climate campaign? So we have a website that is debtforclimate.org and on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook it's the same handle is Debt for Climate and we're getting really active, it's getting really intense in the next few days so you can look up for a lot of um, material coming up for more, more than 45 actions in more than 30 countries. There's going to be mass mobilizations in Argentina that are being led by the workers, there's going to be disruptive actions in the centers of power of Europe which is where the role of people in Europe is the power is to help amplify and hit the IMF, the World Bank, in Paris, in Brussels, in London, in, um, in Munich, and so on. In Washington, D.C., they are mobilizing as well, so that our mobilizations are no longer invisible, but they are coordinated from Sri Lanka to South Africa, from Indonesia to Argentina, coming together and being amplified and visibilized behind a common call together globally where they can no longer avoid that. And it's not the end, but the beginning. This is just the beginning. And it's when we give birth on the streets to this movement that we have been working on for more than half a year. And then we have to go to our COP to be stronger, to put this on the agenda, to force this on the official agenda and make a stronger, stronger mobilizations over time. It's a long-term uh, campaign, a long-term vision. It may take years. And we know we're, we're uh, confronting the most concentrated power in the world in an unprecedented fashion that they have never been confronted with by bringing climate, labor, and social movements together. So we, so we expect, just like I was telling you my personal story, this may be a thousand times harder, that just like they did to us in Argentina, the same kind of operations could happen mm -hmm. 
globally now, but this also needs to be done. And if we are millions, it will be harder for them to to put us down. But you've got uh, a lot of experience uh, now, and and, and you, you can pour that into the debt for climate uh, campaign. Like a lot of experience yeah, on the front line as the persona non grata of the establishment <laughs> being being threatened and uh, having to live now in exile. Um, okay, let me bring it back to you because I'm conscious of time and I know you have to leave us soon. Can you summarize I mean, why you do all this? What, where does your personal motivation come from here? Not just the political goals, but you as a person, why are you up to all of this? Well, you know, for me, the U.S. had a huge impact in my life. I never liked the U.S. Uh, I, I always knew what the U.S. was. And as um, uh, Jose Marti, a Cuban revolutionary poet from the 19th century, said, he also had lived in the U.S. and he said, "I have lived in the beast, and I and I know its vowels, or its vowels." Um, so I also, you know, the, the rottenness of consumerism and capitalism and individualism, and all of the things that are plaguing the world today and leading us to the climate disaster, are nowhere better expressed than in the U.S. society and the U.S. system. And after being in the in there trying to make money to go back home to do something meaningful, it was kind of a sacrifice, a self-imposed, um, you know, just try to make as much money as I could so I could go back and, and do something that was actually, I felt worth it for me and for the world. And I feel, you know, uh, there's no career for me to make. There's nothing for me to gain. You know, we are in this world for a short period of time. We may be gone tomorrow and we are living in the most critical time in human history, facing the biggest threat and crisis in the history of our species, and uh, there is nothing else that I could be that I, that I could be doing other than fighting this fight, however long and whatever it may take. Thank you for that, and, and let me finish with a question I like to ask all the people we speak to on, on the front line here. If there are two or three books that you can recommend. There are a few, but if I can zoom in on one, because this one is something that more and more I keep repeating to myself also to remind, I usually don't recommend books so much, but this is one that is so relevant, not only for fracking or the debt, for colonialism, and for Eurocentrism. This is called The Open Veins of Latin America by Eduardo Galeano, and uh, he's dead now, but he was a great writer, and his book became a masterpiece of Latin American history and the history of colonialism. And th there you can see really well also ex explained how the global south, the, the veins of the global south flow to the global north, you know, all the products, all the raw materials, and how this is done. So the Open Veins of Latin America is by far the most urgent and important book to read, in my opinion, because we also, the climate crisis that we are fighting and we are facing has colonialism at, at its roots. And it's not about 1.5 or the IPCC or these abstract numbers only. Unless you understand the roots, we will not be able to fight the symptoms. So thank you for the interview and helping us spread the word. Thank you very much, Esteban. It's been fascinating and for sharing your, your story. And, and it's been very inspiring.